taking care of your camera and lenses, which features Lightroom might be missing, and also how to charge for your images. Those are some of the questions I answer today in episode 41, which starts now. Hi everybody, my name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode 41 of the video series in which I answer your wildlife photography questions. First up, I have to send a big shout out guys, thank you so much. The comments and feedback has been phenomenal. There's, uh, it's been a while since I've put so many videos out in a week, but it's nice because I'm at home now until about the 4th of April when we do our wildlife photography seminar. So, trying to put as much content out onto YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, I'm gonna say it again, follow me on Snapchat, it is awesome, it's gonna be huge, get on there, it's phenomenal. Um, where were we? Oh, so I'm trying to put out as many videos as I can now. I need more questions from you guys. So, if you have any wildlife photography questions, shoot, let me hear them. Where to shoot, what to shoot, how to shoot, how to post to social media, how to get traction on this, whatever it is to do with your wildlife photography, career, hobby, whatever, let me know and I will answer those questions for you. This includes Lightroom. If you have any Lightroom related questions or Photoshop, processing, how to print, how to publish, whatever. Let's see what answers we can get for you. If I can't answer them, I'll check with the rest of the team and we'll try and do the best that we can to help you along your journey. It, um, the feedback's been great, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Loving this, so let's keep it rolling. I'm hoping to, by Friday, at least get another one video out for the weekend and then let's see what happens next week. Good fun. Anyway, let's get right into it. Five questions on wildlife photography, starting now. Leanne asked on Snapchat, I'm not sure if you can help, but also how do I know what you charge for images? Like a starting point, because it's balancing act of one doesn't want to charge too little, then you destroy the professional market, which is where you ultimately want to head, or too much. Any advice here? This is a phenomenal question, Leanne, thank you. There's a lot of layers to this thing. Before we get to the professional side of it and not destroying that and a balancing act, and it's something that you have to move towards. Let's just have a look at the pricing issue. I think it's not as much a question as of, of what should I price my images at as to, and this is important, what the people out there, the community, the businesses, the publishers are willing to pay for your work. I might think, holy shit, my work's amazing. I wanna charge $10,000 a print. However, my audience, my market, my target people who I wanna sell to think it's only worth $500. For example, how are you gonna leverage what you create, not just in print-wise, but the brand you build for yourself online, when you speak to people, the way you conduct yourself on shoots, the way you conduct yourself on safaris, whatever it is. How do you leverage all of that to make you more of a valuable proposition when someone purchases your work? So, I'm willing to pay, personally, I might be willing to pay 100 Rand for your print. You might say to me, no, 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 it's worth 1,000. There's a problem, yeah? So it's not as much about what you think you can sell your images for as to what the market is willing to pay. How do you figure that out? Look around, do your research, see what's happening out there. A lot of people out there, a lot of photographers are saying, I'm selling my prints for $2,000 a pop. I call bullshit on that because it markets very well to say to people on your Facebook and Instagram, oh, I just sold this print for 10,000 Rand. That's what the going price is, rubbish. So, how do you price your work? A lot of people will give you these formulas where they say, yeah, no, you spend 10 days in the field, so you've got to add your accommodation and your food, then your, your, um, your cameras cost you X, Y, and Z, add that up together, divide it by the time you're away and what you worked and blah, 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 blah. I guarantee you, you're gonna get to a number which your audience won't pay for. Why? Because the market is saturated. There are people out there willing to do what you do, whether it's selling print, publications, magazine, to do it for free. So many people just wanna get their images seen and out there, that they're willing to do what you wanna charge money for, for free. So, that's where it comes back to what is your value proposition? What can you offer your clients that nobody else can? This, and it could be something as simple, yeah, as, as emotional equity. They might follow you online for a long time. They might enjoy your story as a wildlife photographer. And that is the reason they want to purchase from you. That is the reason they might want to pay 
$200, not $150. That's a fight that you have to fight for yourself, that each of us has to fight for ourselves. I can very easily say on a safari, from my business point of view, I want to charge $10,000 for a safari to monopools, pools, which is stupid because that's just taking the piss. There are products out there of $4,000 or $5,000. I know I bring a lot of value, so I will see where I fit in that is still market related and palatable to my final customer. That's kind of the best I can give you. What you need to do on that part of the question is add value, build a brand for yourself, not just for your images, because that's fickle, that can change, for you as a photographer, and then leverage against that to maximize the cost that you can charge for your prints or your publications or your services. Hope that helps. <clears throat> that's actually quite good. I like that, that's pretty cool. So the idea of not destroying the professional market where you want to move to, let me tell you this, the world of online, the world of social media has changed all of that. In the past, it was only the photographers who worked for Nat Geo, who else, BBC or whatever, that had access to the editors and stuff like this. You can now hit up any single editor or photo buyer in the world and make contact with them and work from there. Get in touch, build a brand, it goes back to the previous one, build a brand, get your images out there. Why the, the professional market, as far as I see it, is gone. Those few professional photographers who are hanging on to the title of I'm a professional photographer, therefore I can charge more than John, Joe Soap, who's not, is full of shit. They have no idea what they're talking about and they're going to lose in the long run. It has gone back to the 1960s and 50s and 40s where it was you and I create a relationship and we work together. You can do this now online with social media if you know how to do it correctly. So all these guys who are professional because they've got a camera sponsored or they're professional because one person somewhere bought their print for 10,000 or it's what they do there for it. There's so many ways to try and try and try and define what is this professional thing we're talking about. I would not worry yet on a very serious note. I would not worry about being a professional photographer. I'm not a professional photographer. I can take a good image, image or two, but I'm not professional. I'm a professional photographic and, and private guy. That's what I do. You can be anything. It is how you are gonna take the product that you offer, your images, your services, and leverage that against the market out there. Don't worry about becoming a, a professional photographer. And you know what, I think, if you can destroy the market, do. Get rid of it, and then you can just fall back and do photography like we all want to. That's what it should be about. Leanne, very good question. If you wanna chat about this and kind of find ways to leverage for you, Drop me an email and we can, I'll give you a call. Let's chat. Very, very nice question to start with. Wondrous Nature asked on Instagram, tips on photographing birds, moving, flying or not? Like, what's better to capture their colors, their movements, their essence, especially hummingbirds? They are so difficult. Wondrous Nature, interesting one, but I think we need to define a few things here. Number one, if you're gonna photograph birds and you wanna photograph their essence, that has nothing to do with camera settings, right? That has to do with the way you compose, the approach you take, the background you introduce into the image, because if it's a different color background, my psychology will read it differently. Make sense? If it's a blood red background versus, I don't know, a bright yellow background, I'm gonna interpret your image differently, so the essence is different. I think. If they're flying from a setting point of view, you just want to make sure that the shutter speed is fast enough to capture the movement. The smaller the, the bird, like hummingbirds for example, very quick wing beat, you need very high shutter speed. Also with color, I mean, you, as long as you expose your image correctly of this bird, whether flying or sitting still, if you expose correctly and you've got all that raw data, you will be able to process, because you have to process your images, you will be able to process those images to get a lifelike color. So it comes back, I think the answer to your question in this instance is do the basics right. Dion asks on Instagram, I've learned that ISO is a nightmare and a benefit. My wild eye question is this, one, crystal clear picture, do I shoot raw and a JPEG or just a raw or just a JPEG? Two, moving objects, what is best, shutter speed but still retain clarity? no noise. Dion, sure, there's a lot of questions layered into that. So, let's start with the crystal clear picture part. Raw or JPEG, JPEG or raw, which one, which one? I had, uh, I 
I had a private Lightroom tutorial with someone yesterday and she was still shooting RAW and JPEG. Why? So now you import all of those things into Lightroom, you're sitting with on your, on your hard drive double images was just a waste of space and you're only going to process one anyway. There are very, very few instances these days where you would need to shoot a JPEG file. I can be in the middle of the Mara and on my phone I can transfer from my camera onto the phone, process and be on Instagram in five minutes. So why? And, and that's from purely just shooting raw. I think if you want crystal clear pictures, the, the answer is pretty simple. You have to shoot raw. Not just for, for pretty pictures. For crystal clear pictures, you have to shoot raw. You have to get as much information and data as possible out of every frame that you take and then go and lock it down when you process your images because that's what happens. You shoot a raw file, it's just data. When you process it, it gets locked down when you save your JPEG. If you shoot JPEG, all of those variables that you control in your Lightroom gets locked down as a JPEG in camera and you can't work it afterwards. Cancel. You can work it afterwards, but not as effectively. So from a crystal clear picture point of view, obviously there's things like you have to make sure your shutter speed is fast enough. If it's slow, you need to brace. Include or exclude, depending on the situation, vibration reduction. How fast is your subject moving to create crystal clear pictures? But there is no question. You have to shoot raw. Now the other part of the question, I have to remind myself of this, where was it? Um, second part was moving objects. What's the best shutter speed but still retain clarity, no noise? <clears throat> it links back to the previous question on bird photography. Is, sorry, I'm all messed up with all these questions. What is the best shutter speed but still retain clarity? There is no such thing as best shutter speed. There is a correct shutter speed for the type of image you want to take. If it's a moving wildebeest and I'm going to pan along, I want to stay at 1 30th and under because I'm trying to capture movement. If I'm trying to freeze that wildebeest that's running, for example, I will dial in 1 over 500 or 1 over 1000. The faster the subject moves, the faster your shutter speed has to be. Noise will not be influenced by shutter speed. Does that make sense? If, and okay, in a roundabout way it does actually, follow me here, is if it's getting dark and there's something very fast moving that you want to freeze the action on, a couple of things will happen. I'm shooting an AV, so I'm going to take my ISO up, which in aperture mode pulls my shutter speed up. Happy so far. When I do my ISO up, it might introduce digital noise. Not necessarily, but it might. But only in the dark areas of your frame. So, if you're shooting, make something up, a lion running through grass, and it's all kind of tawny color, a little bit of light, so it's not too dark, you're not going to have a hell of a lot of noise. Um, shutter speed does not relate to noise. It ISO relates to noise, but these days, God, I'm going to say this again, guys, do not be scared of high ISOs anymore. In the old days of Nikon D750, even Canon 72, they were horrible on high ISO. Noise everywhere. Things have changed. The tech today, I would happily shoot 6400 ISO in a blink if I could get the shot because I can manage it, I can hold still, and I can clean it up if necessary to a certain extent in Lightroom. Rather get a shot that's a little bit grainy then not get the shot at all because, oh my goodness, it's going to be noisy. That said, Dion, I know where you're coming from, is make sure your shutter speed stays up. If that means getting a slightly higher ISO to make it happen, do it. Get the shot, and then if you're not sure, ask me the question later on, how do I reduce, reduce, reduce noise in Lightroom? Charlene asked on Instagram, how do you clean and take care of your lenses and camera? Charlene, very, very good question because a lot of people don't even think about this. So taking care of is all the obvious things. Don't throw it around, don't get water on it. That said, I'm, I'm very bad on my camera gear. I don't break it on purpose, but if you are so pedantic about a camera, yeah, I know you understand, you paid a lot of money for it, but if you are so pedantic about getting a little bit of dust on your camera, you're gonna probably not get some shots. If you have to lay down next to a dam and get a little bit of mud on the bottom of your camera, I've seen this, I've had it on safaris, people don't want to put their camera down on the floor and shoot up because it's going to get dirty underneath, you're going to miss shots. At the end of the day, let's be kind of stand back for a moment, a camera is just a tool. It's like a hammer or a nail. I know it sounds harsh, but if you think of it that way, ensure the damn thing if it breaks. If you think about it that way, you are not going to feel that bad to get into different, slightly different situations, maybe get it a bit dirty, get a couple of drops of rain on it. It's not going to break. So taking care of it 
up to point I get, but don't be so pedantic about your gear that it has to be perfectly shiny. As long as the inside stuff is working, you're gonna get good images. From a cleaning point of view, after every big trip, so after every week, two weeks, all of our gear, over here, all of our gear goes in to get cleaned and sensor cleaned and polished and so on and so forth. So, yeah, you know, that, that's for me. I mean, I don't do sensor cleans necessarily out in the field because there's wind, there's dust, there's lines running around and it becomes a mess or whatever. So, I don't know where that came from. But I don't do that in the field because I take care of it in the field as in, not what I spoke about earlier, but I take care of it in the sense that I minimize the dust that gets inside. So, for example, go and check the Wildlife Facebook page. Put a shower cap on the front of the lens when you're in the field. It stops excessive dust coming in. If you're changing lens, don't point it up. Point it down, get it out of the wind, and then change the lens so dust doesn't blow in. Small things like that. So I think short answer for that question, Charlene, and it's a good one, is common sense. Thomas on Instagram asked, I've been using Lightroom for a year and I just love it. Photoshop is still so hard to get. Am I missing any feature from Photoshop that I cannot get in Lightroom? Thomas, I was originally only going to do four questions in this episode, but I like this one. You asked this on Instagram. And I spoke about Photoshop and Lightroom in yesterday's episode as well. And there is still no argument. Don't even worry about learning Photoshop again. It's not necessary. It's not worth it. Stay with Lightroom. That said, you raise a very interesting question as to are there features right now in Photoshop that Lightroom needs to get? I think there's a couple. Um, the first one that comes to mind is content aware. Now, if you hit Q while you're in Lightroom, you go into the Clone and Heal tool, and you can clone out dust spots, which is, which is meant for, or a telephone wire, for example. Now, the algorithms that Lightroom uses is pretty good, but the Content Aware, which is in, in, in Photoshop, for those of you who don't know, Content Aware is a feature where I can circle a specific area that's bad, that I want to get rid of, I hit Backspace to delete, and Content Aware then goes and looks and places everything in there so it looks like nothing happened. It is phenomenal. That for me in Lightroom, in Lightroom would be great. Other features, I mean, I know some of you are going to say, some of you are going to say we need things like layers in, photo, in, in Lightroom. Please, God, no. Let's not go there because then we're heading back towards Photoshop. If you know how to use your brushes, gradient filter, and radial filter tool enough, you can create layers by doing different brushes and things. So you can do this. But I would rather like to see, instead of bringing features over from Photoshop, I would like to have things in Lightroom like, imagine this. Imagine I could take the sliders, for example, uh, how's it go? Exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, blacks, clarity, vibrant, saturation. That's your basic panel. If I could drag and drop those and customize them in a specific order, like I process, I always start with my black point, my white point, then I check shadows and highlights. So if I could customize that, and also the basic, the tone curve, HSL. If I could customize my, my, my Lightroom user interface, I would like that. Also, for example, is in your brushes, in the special adjustment brush, if I could have the ability to, to, to modify and adjust single color channels, that would be interesting. But Thomas, no, I don't think, apart from content aware, right now, just, uh, just your, your, your question just came in, there's nothing else that I can think of that should be included across into Lightroom that you're missing. Put it this way, let's step back from it again. If you use Lightroom to its full ability and you understand how to process, because a lot of people don't, they think they do, but they don't understand the true power of Lightroom, then you're not going to miss anything because you're going to be able to take your raw file from as you import it through a series of adjustments and produce a beautiful JPEG. So no, you're not going to miss anything like, uh, what's it called? Content there will be nice, but not the end of the world. Good question. I like that one. Guys, that's done. That's episode 41 wrapped up. Five questions, some good ones in there. I like that one. Very, very nice. So, like I said, guys, please send me some more questions. Anything to do with wildlife photography, I want to try and get to at least episode 45 by end of next week. So let's see what we can do. Should be fun. Um, what else is happening? Instagram ticking. Go and follow me there. I've got some nice stuff coming up. Snapchat is always ongoing. Twitter on and off. Facebook I'll be on. All of these videos goes on there. So um, anywhere you find me, ask your questions and more details at the end of this video. If you like the video, guys, share it out. Leave a comment. Tell me it's great or not, what you want to change, ask your questions, really appreciate it. My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and I'll see you guys next time.